Hi everyone and welcome back to Learn Your Radiology. Today, get ready, buckle yourself in. We're going to do 10 more cases in 10 more minutes. This is part three of the FAST10 Neuroradiology Review Cases. So let's get ready and let's go. Now we're using all the bad PowerPoint animations here. So we've got those on lock. Um, as before, we're going to do 10 cases. It's going to be about one minute per case. We're going to see some select images. We're going to see a multiple choice question. We'll quickly review the answer. Just a reminder, if you want to see the long versions of these cases, they're already available on the board review playlist. So go back and check those out if you're interested. So case number 21 here, we have a 48 year old man with sudden right hearing loss. We've got a heavy T2 on the left here. That's a kiss or a fiesta. And we've got a post contrast here on the right. Our choices are CP angle tumors. So meningioma, vestibular schwannoma, arachnoid cyst, or epidermoid cyst? The answer to this one is a vestibular schwannoma. This is a pretty classic appearance to a CP angle vestibular schwannoma. What you see is you've got a mass expanding the internal auditory canal, extending into the CP angle here, causing a little bit of mass effect on the midbrain or in pons and a middle cerebellar peduncle there. On T2, you can see it uh, has a nice CSF cleft with the pond, so it's not coming from the ponds. The best way to differentiate these from meningiomas are the involvement of the IEC, and in particular, the expansion of the IEC, which you see here. Meningiomas tend to be centered outside the IEC and don't cause that kind of expansion. Case number 22 is a 35-year-old with bilateral hearing loss. Got two images from a temporal bone CT, one of each temporal bone. Your choices are cochlear aplasia, jugular dehiscence, external auditory canal exostosis, or cholesteatoma? So your answer here is external auditory canal exostosis. That's also known as a surfer's ear. The reason this is called that is because the exposure to chronic cold water is an irritant to the bone of the external auditory canal here. You see there is proliferation of bone along the external auditory canal. It's bilateral and it's symmetric. Uh, this is often seen in people who surf, who have uh, do cold water activities. Uh, this has kind of an ant mini appearance. So if you see it, you just got to recognize what that is. Case number 23 is a 64 year old man with coagulopathy and transient numbness and weakness of the right upper extremity. Some visual changes. This image on the left is a coronal flare. This image on the right is a MIP from an MR venogram. Your choices are epidural abscess, dural sinus thrombosis, dural AV fistula, or angiosarcoma. So this is a case of dural sinus thrombosis. What you see here on the coronal flares, you've got abnormal hyperintensity in the location of the sigmoid sinus here. It's a T2 hyperintense where you should normally see a flow void, such as on this normal side. Uh, you might think that's an extraaxial collection or something like that. But if you look at the venogram, what you see is truncation of the transverse sinus, which should be here. You see the contralateral one is normal here. And you see no sigmoid or transverse sinus on that side. Uh, but the complication of this is that you can get a venous infarct or hemorrhage. So if you see unusually distributed hemorrhages in the posterior fossa around the posterior temporal lobes here, think about venous infarct. Case number 24 is a 75-year-old woman with dysarthria and spasticity. Of two axial images from a CT here. Your tr answer choices are idiopathic basal ganglia calcification, Wilson's disease, pantothenate kinate deficiency, or Huntington's disease. So your answer here is idiopathic basal ganglia calcification. In this case, what you see is abnormal calcification in the brain bilaterally. It involves a little bit of the uh, corona radiata here. It involves the caudate, uh, the patamen. You've got some involvement of the posterior fossa, but it's mostly symmetric and it's bilateral. This is a condition of familial accumulation of calcium, uh, predominantly in the basal ganglia, but you can see it in other areas. Uh, this is also called far disease when it's primary. You can have this as a secondary condition from renal failure or hyperparathyroidism. Uh, these patients tend to get movement disorders as well as dementia and psychosis related to this uh, because of the involvement of the cerebral hemispheres and the basal ganglia. Case number 25 is a 63 year old with history of lung transplant and headache. I have two sets of MRA MIPS here. Your choices for answers are Takayasu arteritis, temporal arteritis, fibromuscular dysplasia, 
or subclavian steel. So to get this answer, which is subclavian steel, you have to recognize that these are two different types of MRA images. This is a time of flight MRA on the left here. You see there's absence of the vertebral artery. If you look closely, you'll also note that there's no subclavian artery. The reason you don't see it on the time of flight images is because it's the flow is reversed. If you do a contrast MRA, which of this is on the left, you see that it's actually filling with contrast from above. You see some retrograde filling of the subclavian artery there as well. So subclavian steel is when the proximal subclavian is occluded and you have filling of the vertebral artery via retrograde flow into the subclavian artery. Uh, the symptom can sometimes get worse with arm activity. Uh, in this case, being able to know the difference between these two types of images can help you a little bit, but you can still get it by not seeing the subclavian artery here in the upper chest. Case number 26 is a 41 year old man with syncope, happened to be in an elevator. Two CT images here. Your choices are traumatic hemorrhage, hypertensive hemorrhage, amyloid angiopathy, or arteriovenous malformation. You're dealing with a hemorrhage probably. The question is really getting at what is the most likely cause. In this case, this is a classic location for hypertensive hemorrhage. So even though this patient's a little bit younger than typical, this is probably still a hypertensive hemorrhage. In this case, it's a very classic appearance though. It has this lenticular form. It's centered in the thalamus and basal ganglia. Uh, usually it's patients that are a little older. The mortality rate is quite high from these. The common locations that you'll see them are the basal ganglia thalamus, pons, and cerebellar hemispheres. If you think about amyloid angiopathy, they're usually lobar hemorrhages that are more peripheral. Uh, this could be an underlying AV malformation, but we don't see any evidence of that here. We don't see any um, nidus of vessels or abnormal flow voids uh, to, to kind of suggest that that's what's going on here. Case number 27 is a 54-year-old with history of diabetes insipidus, now with visual changes. Got a pre-contrast and post-contrast sagittal image here. Your choices are pituitary adenoma, germinoma, hypothalamic hamartoma, or craniopharyngioma. So the correct choice here is craniopharyngioma. Uh, what you have is you have a mass in the supracellular and hypothalamic region. But if you look, it's nodular and pretty cystic. Uh, you see these areas of avid enhancement mixed with cystic non-enhancement. That's a pretty classic appearance for craniopharyngioma. Now craniopharyngiomas, uh, they can be two subtypes. You can have the adamantinous subtype, which tends to be younger patients, or the squamous papillary type, which tend to be the older subgroup of patients. This is probably a squamous papillary one. Case number 28 is a 36 year old with a history of seizure. Choices are ganglioglioma, cystocercosis, toxoplasmosis, or GBM. You have a flare and post contrast image here. Uh, so the answer here is ganglioglioma. If you take a look, you've got a lesion in the medial temporal lobe here. It's got a little bit of abnormal flare around it, but it's predominantly cystic here in the medial temporal lobe. Very little, if any, enhancement, maybe a little bit of linear enhancement here. So ganglioglioma's are low grade tumors, usually grade one or grade two. They tend to be cystic. They can have a little bit of nodular enhancement sometimes, an enhancing nodule. They're tend to be indistinguishable from DNETs. In the testing setting, however, if you see a nodule of enhancement, you should call it a ganglioglioma. If you don't see that, you should call it a DNET. But in reality, it can, it can be impossible to differentiate. This one happens to be a ganglioglioma. These are the most common neoplastic causes of epilepsy. So if you see a young patient with seizure and a tumor, think about ganglioglioma and DNET. Case number 29 is a 50-year-old man with weakness in his bilateral lower extremities. Difficulty walking, got two MR images, sagittal T2, axial T2. Your choices are meningioma, epidural abscess, schwannoma, and synovial cyst. This is a case of a synovial cyst. What you see here is you've got a cystic lesion along the posterior margin of the spinal canal here. It's got a dark T2 rim and a centrally T2 hyperintense. If you look, it has a little bit of a tail that looks like it's connecting up to this left-sided degenerated facet, and it's kind of asymmetric to the left. It's causing narrowing of the spinal cord here, or spinal canal rather, here. 
Uh, these usually communicate with a joint, and if they're off the midline, you should call them a synovial cyst. If you see them in the midline and it looks like it's connected to the spinous process or degeneration between the spinous processes, then the another choice which is reasonable is a bursal cyst. Our final case in this set, case number 30, is a 39-year-old with neck pain and left arm weakness. We have two post-contrast images here, a sagittal and an axial. Your choices are lymphoma, discitis osteomyelitis, neurofibroma, or meningioma. This is a case of lymphoma. What you see here is you have relatively homogeneous enhancement involving the bone. It's involving several of the vertebral bodies here, some of the posterior elements. You've got extension into the epidural space and prevertebral space, but you don't really have a lot of cystic uh, kind of fluid components that kind of excludes infection. Probably most discitis osteomyelitis will have fluid here, uh, but when it's this homogeneous, the things you really are thinking about are lymphoma or myeloma. Metastatic disease tends to uh, also be like more rounded, a little bit more degenerated. Uh, so lymphoma is like a nice choice here. Uh, your differential though, like I said, is metastasis and myeloma. This patient's relatively young though, which leads you to believe that it's, it's probably lymphoma. All right, everyone, thanks for tuning in for this third FAST10 set. We had cases 21 through 30 here. We're going to have more of these videos until we get up all the way to the final uh, case, which is going to be case number 60. Good luck uh, preparing for your exams, and hopefully these cases are helping. Uh, be sure to come back and check out the rest of the videos. Thanks.